Uh, hey, Ash here from All Things Dentistry, the place where we love to share those unwritten hits and tips of dentistry. Well, it's pandemic time. It's the first week of June. And the patients that we had been treating with pharmacotherapy are now starting to percolate and we need to see them. So this and, you know, seeing them can be a little bit of a kind of a tricky, tricky issue because we want to we want to see them, but we also want to minimize an aerosol generating procedures. So how can you do that efficiently? One of the ways that my buddy showed me was, yes, and this is the same guy that showed me about the cow horn forceps. If you haven't seen that video, take a look at that, how to properly use them. I thought I'd use them properly, but after 20 years, I learned that I'm not. And using a crosscut Fisher Burr in a slow speed. Now, I actually couldn't believe it. And I want to show you, show you with this case that where I used it, and I've used it a few times, and I feel confident that now it's like, oh, we can share this. Um, but, you know, the crosscut Fisher Burr, I remember looking in my supply room thinking, looking at this old latch burr from like 1959, thinking, why do I have, why do we have this slow speed 557 crosscut burr? And sure enough, here we are in 2020 using this technology back from 1969 or whatever it is. So what am I talking about? Well, a crosscut burr actually has, so this is a, a 701 burr, you know, we use a 557. Anyways, it's a straight Fisher burr or a tapered Fisher burr, but it's got these little cuts in the blades. So that crosscut actually, is it is developed to increase the efficiency so as you can read here it all says it here the particularly true of small um, so reduce reduced use of cross cuts cross cuts are needed on fisher burrs to obtain adequate cutting effectiveness at slow speeds or low speeds but they're not needed at high speeds so we started using this burr at 40,000 rpm and it works really well I can't believe it. So if you got, you know, you can use a round burr, but I've used a round burr on enamel and it just does not seem to work. But this crosscut, man, it does the trick. So let's take a look at this case. We'll walk you through it. You know, actually, before I do that, let me show you this. So we, this is a pandemic and we have a pandemic puppy and it's a yellow lab. There are my boys. This guy is starting to love the mud. Oh man. And he's in there for probably about 25 minutes doing his job as a retriever. He's, <laughs> Woo! He's sleeping right now. You might hear him snoring. So this case here presented uh, just today, this morning, and this patient had been treated with pharmacotherapy for a couple of weeks, and it's just not doing the trick. So the diagnosis is, and after clinical testing, symptomatic irreversible papitis with symptomatic apoperitis on tooth number 17. And you can see pretty much he fractured the, the restoration and he's been having decay and likely this, well, not likely, the tooth is now irreversibly inflamed. So we're going to do the, the endodontic therapy on this case and we're going to use our 557 burr. So let's take a look here. So we've numbed the patient up. We've done our clinical tests. We've diagnosed it. We've done now uh, numbed him up. Use a PSA. That's another tip. If you haven't seen that video, I actually learned that from uh, Alan Nassay. Using a PSA on all these maxillary posterior teeth, it works absolutely incredible. Long-term palatal anesthesia, is it's unbelievable. So then we place a rubber dam. We use our secondary seal, which is this opal dam. If, if you haven't used it yet, I recommend you getting it. It reduces the amount of saliva coming into the operating field, and it reduces the probability of having your caustic irrigants going into the patient's mouth. Super useful. Um, what I do do... In this case, we rinsed the operating field with some hypochlorite. You can see it happening right there. The patient does do a pre-procedural uh, coronavirus hydroperoxide rinse. And this is just another added safety benefit here. But you'll see in a second, once we remove this fractured amalgam, it all kind of goes to heck. So let's go ahead here. So we are now going to remove the restoration and get in, create our access. There we go. We're just taking another look. So there's our 557 long shank. So it's a long shank and we use a long burr so we can keep the head of the handpiece out of our operating field. This is an electric handpiece and we're able to control the RPM. So that's super helpful. We're down to 40,000 RPM and we're just going to go and remove that restoration. So let's go ahead and we'll just do it in high speed here. So this thing, I mean, it doesn't quite cut like butter, but it is super effective. It's I was actually really impressed. I've been impressed both all times I've been using it. I haven't tried it on cutting through a porcelain crown. Um, like I'll have to use a diamond with that. But I'm going to show you, in this case, we're going to use a 557 just to remove that restoration and some enamel. 
it works really well. And then I'm going to show you using just a diamond and a slow speed on how to re just reduce the cuffs. So you can see once we break the seal, how well this, all this, the seal works really well to keep the saliva out because we're removing that restoration just to make sure that there's the tooth is restorable. Um, so we're, we remove that restoration there. And then you can see the saliva start flowing in. So that's one of the reasons why we do use that secondary seal. So we're going to remove any more of the decay out of that area. And then what we're going to do is we're still going to remove any decay. Then we're going to switch to a, I'm going to switch to a number two round and we're going to go into the pulp chamber. So just before we do that, we're going to reapply our secondary seal. So what happens is it flows all over the place here. Let me pause this here. Sometimes it flows all over the place. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually use a number two round or a number four and just remove this so I can get a straight line access into where my operating field is or into our pulp chamber. So we're looking to make an access right along this plane between this mesial buccal cusp and the palatal cusp. So we'll place that all in there. I'm going to light cure that. You know, ideally what I should have done is re-rinse with hypo again before I went in. So at this point I should have, and I'll do that next time, um, reapply re hypochlorite. So you can see we don't have any air water syringes. We can't use it because that generates potential, potentially generates the uh, an aerosol. What we're, so that's why we're getting all that dust on here. So we're just, what I'm doing right now with this long shank, slow speed burr, number two round, is I'm headed towards, right towards that palatal orifice and boom, I'm in. So that palatal orifice on a max ray tooth is usually the biggest orifice. You know, you can see it right there. And this is a great time if you have, you know, if you need to, if the patient feels something and you want to do the absolutely incredible technique of doing an intrapulpal, which is can be extremely painful, this is a great little hole just to place your ear, get your, your anesthetic syringe into and get great back pressure. Rather than trying to do the whole access and then try to get you know some pressure uh, in the pulp chamber, that's a, a really great technique. Somebody taught that to me. So another, you know, I was watching this. Normally I don't use this burr anymore. This is actually, it was in the, the, uh, the kit that I was using. This is a endo, endo access burr, LA access burr from Cybron. I find it's really aggressive, but I was sold on that little tip a long time ago. You know, that little, this little pylon tip. Stephen Buchanan sells it. I mean, it works really well. I find that this burns and it, I find it actually quite cumbersome to use. I'll use my endo zebra, but it was there. Uh, so we use that to do our endo access. And this is still at 50, you know, actually 40,000 RPM. So, and then what we're gonna do is, I wanna show you just reducing the cuss uh, with a slow speed diamond. Now, it, you know, it's gonna chew out, you're gonna have to clean out the diamond somehow at another, maybe uh, when you do your pre-disinfection pre because you can't wash it here. But what we're doing here is this is just at 40,000 RPM reducing the cuffs. So it is doable with a burr, with a diamond burr. Likely, I'm not sure if it's gonna reduce the life of the diamond burr, probably it will, hard to say, uh, but it does work. So, and the reason why I'm reducing the cusps here is just to get a stable reference point. And when the patient is done, it's a little bit out of the patient's bite. So that's that, and that's really all I wanted to show you for today, just to go ahead and take a look at using, you know, how do you access in this pandemic time. So if you don't have all the PPE, but if you've got the basics of PPE, right now we're using a class three mask. We're using, um, if it's non aerosol generating procedures, so we're using class three mask, type three mask. We're using um, goggles. You can use a hairnet. I've got a, a large drape on me, a surgical gown, and that's it. I have done an aerosol generating procedure and it was not a lot of fun. So it, that's where we're going to stay with non aerosol generating procedures. So hopefully that helps. Let me know if you have any questions or anything like that. Don't forget to place your comments below. It's always great to hear from you. And I want to make these relevant during the pandemic time because um, you know what? It's, it is what it is. So um, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.